Okay, thanks to those of you that chose the ski slopes, uh, or chose evolutionary robotics over the ski slopes this morning. I promise to keep you entertained and educated as usual. So, uh, evolutionary robotics, I don't think I have much to say about the assignments. Any questions about the assignments? I've talked to a few of the grad students, seem to have reasonable final projects. If you haven't talked to me or Krishna, uh, about your final project ideas, please do so sooner rather than later so we can help you calibrate your expectations. Otherwise, uh, let's get back to uh, lecture 10 uh, where we're talking about active categorical perception. This is sort of the sixth and final building block in the ser uh, building block of cognition that we're looking at. Um, we have sort of left minimal cognition territory at this point. We're dealing with a clearly not minimal, uh, ro minimally complex robot anymore. We've got our anthropomorphic robot. And just very briefly to remind you of the experiment we're working our way through, we've got this body. We're going to evaluate every CTRNN 16 times on this robot to see how well it does at manipulating these two sets of objects to distinguish between spheres. And ellipsoids, the robot's controlled by a CTRNN. And we ended last time by talking about the 47th and 48th neuron in the robot's head. Uh, when you categorize objects out there in the world, for many decades there was a, a, an argument ongoing in neuroscience and is still going today. What exactly is going on in your head when there is something ambiguous in your environment? You look at it from a different perspective. You might physically manipulate the object, reach out, alter your environment in some way to, uh, to exaggerate the differences between these two categories. Yeah, we talked about this last time. Exaggerate the differences between two or more sets of objects or phenomenon out there, or possibly manipulate an object to make it feel, literally feel more familiar. Okay. Simplest thing to do would be to assign a neuron to every possible category that's important for you to recognize. For our uh, robot here, the only thing it needs to do is distinguish between spheres and ellipsoids. So we could assign 47 to a sphere and 48 to an ellipsoid. And if the robot lights up neuron 47 more than neuron 48, that's the robot telling us it thinks it's in the presence of a sphere and vice versa for the ellipsoid. And we talked about why that's not a great way to go last time. Simple, that's, that's the advantage. What's the cost? Take up too much space. Take up too much space in the robot's head or in your head, yeah? So what we started in on last time was looking at a more complicated way that the investigators take the values arriving at neurons 47 and 48 and incorporate that into, a, as we'll see in a moment, incorporate that into a fitness function. Basically use that as uh, how the robot is telling us what it thinks it's in the presence of. And as we started to see last time, it's kind of complicated, but there's a reason behind this complexity. The reason is that when we're all done, we should be able to use the same two neurons to distinguish between three objects, four objects, big spheres, little spheres, big ellipsoids, little ellipsoids, whatever categories it is that's important for this robot, we could pack more and more stuff into the same neural real estate. It's a simple example, but it's a good exemplar of, again, what's going on in neuroscience is trying to understand how we pack the thousands, possibly millions of things you know into the limited real estate you have between your ears. It's not so clear how Mother Nature has solved this problem in our case. In this case, it's not Mother Nature figuring it out. It's the investigator saying, here's how the robot should pack this information into its head. And then the evolutionary algorithm is going to try and tune all 48 tau values, all, for, uh, all of the uh, weights, and all of the biases to make that happen. Yeah? To see how, they, uh, how the investigators started to encode this, we were looking at a phase diagram last time where on the horizontal axis, we're looking at the output of neuron 47. And on the vertical axis, we're looking at the output of neuron 48. 
And just to remember that in a CTRNN, this entire term, this is the value that is extracted from neuron 47. Inside neuron 47, it has a raw value, but we want to sort of contain this value to be within a certain range. So we're going to, uh, we're going to treat this entire term as the output of 47, this entire term as the output of 48. We could, again, doing things simply, just look at the final value of 47 and 48 at the end of the simulation. That's not what they're doing here. They're actually going to use the way in which 47 and 48 change over just the last 5% of the time steps of the simulation. Yeah? Remember when we, a few weeks ago, when we first introduced CTRNNs, CTRNNs have a number of nice properties. One of them is that they allow the neur uh, neuron values to change continuously. We can look at the dynamics of the neurons, how the neurons' values are changing over time. And any instantaneous value of the neurons is maybe not that important. Again, same thing goes for our brains. Maybe the, in, the value of neuro, the values or electrical stimulation of your neurons at any given time is maybe, in the grand scheme of things, less important than how the, the electricity in your neurons changes over time. Yeah. Okay, so we started last time by looking at a phase, uh, a, a, a trajectory, how, for example, the value of 47 and 48 changes from the 95% of the way through the simulation. What are the two values of these neurons at the next time step, next time step, next time step, next time step? And then what are, are the values of these two neurons at the final time step? We're gonna introduce a little bit of terminology here. We're going to, uh, we're gonna put a bounding box around this trajectory in two-dimensional space. And this bounding box is going to set, be set by the maximum value of 47, the minimum value of 47, the minimum value of 48, and the maximum value of 48. This bounding box, they're going to refer to this as R sub S sub E. Again, I'm not really happy with this terminology, but we're stuck with it. So this is, uh, this is the rectangle uh, surrounding the dynamics of 47 and 48 when the robot's in the presence of a sphere during the eth trial, or the eth evaluation. Remember, every CTRNN is being evaluated 16 times. So for each, CTR, each CTRNN, they're actually going to compute or construct 16 of these rectangles. This is, at the moment, the eth rectangle out of those 16. And in this case, we're assuming that the robot was in the presence of the sphere. Okay. Let's imagine now that we take, uh, we take the same CTRNN, we reset the robot, we plug the CTRNN back uh, into the robot, and we allow the robot to behave again, but now it's going to behave in the presence of an ellipsoid D. What are neurons 47 and 48 going to do in this case? We place the robot originally with a sphere underneath its palm, and the CTRNN caused it to start manipulating that object in some way, which caused all of the neurons' values to change over time. We took some of the change of 47 and 48 and constructed this bounding box. Take away the sphere, put an ellipsoid underneath, same CTRNN, what happens now? The problem, they, they might have different values, right? The robot, a CTRNN could, in theory, just cause the robot to stay still, right? In which case, the values of 47 and 48 are probably going to be the same in these two cases. Let's assume the robot does move in some way, so the values of 47 and 48 do something else, yeah? So this, this is our rectangle for the robot when it was in the presence of a sphere in the eth uh, trial, and we now place a bounding box around these values, and we get a second rectangle 
which is what the robot experienced when it was in the presence of the ellipsoid during the EF trial, the next trial. Yeah. Okay, so I'm not going to draw all 16 <laughs> rectangles. But let's imagine that we bring the robot back in the presence of the sphere again, and in this case it draws a slightly different trajectory. So in the presence of the sphere, uh, a second time, we get this rectangle, another R sub S sub E. We put the robot in the presence of one of the rotated ellipsoids. We get another trajectory. It should have different colors here, my apologies we get a fourth rectangle for another presentation of the ellipsoid during another trial. Now, this is all still just one ellipsoid. So far, so good? Okay. We've got eight rectangles generated in the presence of spheres, eight rectangles generated in the presence of an ellipsoid. We are now going to draw yet another bounding box, C sub S, around all the R sub S boxes. At the moment I only have two, so here's the bounding box around these R sub S's, which is C sub S. This bigger bounding box is going to represent the robot telling us this is the category for spheres. These things are spheres. Same thing for the R sub Ds. We draw another bounding box around these bounding boxes, which is going to be referred to as C sub D, the category corresponding to ellipsoids. Yeah. OK, so we've basically just taken the values of 47 and 48 and constructed these new mathematical constructs. We're now going to take C sub S and C sub D and plug it into the fitness function. We're now going to start evolving populations of C tier and Ns to do something. What is it that you what, what is it that you think we want to evolve the C tier and Ns to do? If we want the robot to tell us that it knows the difference between spheres and ellipsoids, or recognize the difference between spheres and ellipsoids. We want to uh, change it so that, in a way that will make it so that for neurons 47 and 48, we're going to make it so those two bounding boxes don't intersect. We don't want C sub S and C sub D to overlap, right? If they overlap, if there is a trajectory that, if they overlapped and there was a trajectory that fell in that area of overlap, from the perspective of the robot, what does that mean for the robot? A robot controlled by that C tier and N. It doesn't know if it's a sphere or an ellipsoid? I'm feeling something. I can't see it. I don't know whether it's a sphere or an ellipsoid, right? My phone is ringing in the middle of the night. I reach out. I'm not sure if I'm grabbing my phone or something else, some other rectangular solid on my bedside table. I, I, I don't know. Yeah? We want these bounding boxes to be uh, have as little to no overlap as possible. That would be magnifying between category differences. We want neurons 47 and 48 to do very different things when it's in the presence of these two objects. Yeah? OK. So let's have a look at the fitness function now. In this case, they constructed their fitness function by summing two terms, F1 and F2. We'll just briefly jump down to F2 for a moment. You'll see the uh, set intersection symbol down here. They are trying to minimize the area of overlap between C sub S and C sub D. So the that's the intuition here. The denominator here, this is just a normalization, uh, this is a normalization term. They're normalizing this fraction here so that it ranges between zero and one. If the numerator is zero, that means there's no overlap between C sub S and C sub D. That's what they want, right? Zero is best. If, uh, if there's maximal overlap between C sub S and C sub D, that's the worst 
possible thing, yeah? They take one minus this term, which ranges between zero and one, so that they're always trying to maximize fitness, yeah? So the best possible thing the robot can do in terms of categorization is get an F2 equal to one, which is no overlap between these two bounding boxes. Yeah. You'll notice there's a conditional here. It gets no points for F2 if F1 is less than one. So let's jump back and talk about F1 for a moment. I'll just tell you, I mean, you could probably read this off, D sub E, is the Euclidean distance between the object and the center of the palm of the robot at the end of the eth trial. Remember, at the beginning of every trial, we start by placing the robot's palm on the object, in which case the distance between the palm and the object is zero. And d max is the maximum possible distance the robot can move its palm away from the object. What is F1 uh, selecting for? And why is it here? Why, why are we not just evolving f for F2? We want to ensure that the robot is actually interacting with the object. Absolutely, right? So you can probably guess, I'm guessing, the investigator started by evolving just for this, uh, for this term. It didn't work because the vast majority of the things that a CTRNN would cause the robot to do is to remove its palm from the object, right? If you're trying to find your phone in the middle of the night, the worst thing you can do is just not grab anything on your bedside table, right? So what we're seeing, we're going to see more and more examples of this as we go, is they introduced some scaffolding into the fitness function. Scaffolding is an idea that comes from developmental psychology, uh, the study uh, of human development. Parents uh, do this with children all the time. We scaffold their experience. We're trying to teach them some, some concept that's very difficult for them. So we give them an easier version of the problem, or we give them a hint. And once they start to do well at that hint, once evolution starts to evolve CTRNNs, that minimizes D sub E, keeps the robot's palm in contact with the object, then we start to provide additional reward for doing other stuff. Yeah? What's an example of scaffolding with, uh, from human development? How do adults scaffold a child learning? Absolutely. We teach kids motor primitives about reading, right? There's a set of physical actions that go along with it before comprehension happens. Yeah, great example. We're doing scaffolding right now. I could have thrown the evolutionary robotics textbook at you at the end of the summer and say, see you at the exam, right? Other examples? The training wheels on my feedback back in time. The training wheels on the bike is usually the canonical example of scaffolding, right? Starting to learn to ride a two-wheeled vehicle, extremely difficult. How do you even get started, right? Usually there's failure within the first half second or second of the attempt. There's no gradient. There's no way for a learner to start to even know whether they're making progress. Same thing with this robot controlled by random CTRNNs. It keeps losing contact with the object and the robot's blind. How can it even start to learn to dis or evolve the ability to distinguish between spheres and ellipsoids? Once a child gets the idea of cycling and the parent has an intuition, it's time, you start to re remove the scaffolding, remove the training wheels. Yeah? In theory, probably uh, partway through the evolutionary algorithm, we could turn off F1. Most of the CTRNNs at that point are probably causing the robot to stay in contact with the object. We could just select for this behavior. So far, so good? Okay. Okay, let's have a look at some evolved behavior. 
Uh, I'm gonna maximize each of these videos in turn because I want you to try as best you can simultaneously to watch the behavior of the robot arm and also watch the visualization that's in the bottom left. Hopefully those of you in the back of the room can see this. The visualization in the bottom left of the screen here, this is a visualization that's constructed from the values of neurons 47 and 48 in the, in the evolved CTRNN controlling this robot. Here we go. It's a little better. What's happening? How is the CTRNN doing? Pretty good? It just rolls the object. Hopefully some of you had started to build up a, a guess about what this robot was going to evolve to do. The first time I read this paper, this was not what I was expecting. It seems to work. What is the blue arrow representing? It's choice. So that's the robot telling us vertical. What does a vertical blue arrow mean? The robot doesn't know, right? And then it knows, doesn't know, knows. How are they? Com how are they drawing the blue? Uh, how are they drawing the blue arrow given the values of 47 and 48? What, what's happening with the trajectory of 47 and 48? What does it mean for the robot to not know or know or think that it's in the presence of a sphere or an ellipsoid? At this point, we have C sub S and probably a non-overlapping C sub D. Uh, the cluster or the trajectory, right? So maybe 47 and 48 are at this value at a certain point in time, which is the vertical blue arrow, right? This is the robot saying, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Sphere. Wait, wait. No, I'm not sure. Actually, it's an ellipsoid. Yeah? Okay. Does it, does it ever go over to the sphere and then go back? Uh, if not in this video, then in, it just did? Did you see it? Yeah, for like a split second it did. Got it. Uh, you'll notice in the upper left here, so this is in position A. So this is the evolved CTRNN where they place the robot's arm in initial position A. We're going to look at exactly the same CTRNN, but now they start with the robot in position B. Is the robot magnifying intercategory differences? Can you see a difference in how the robot moves when it's in the presence of a sphere and ellipsoid? No, not so easy to see. Whatever this difference is, not so obvious from our perspective, but it seems sufficient for the robot. It seems to be right most of the time. Questions? Doesn't it not matter if it like moves a different way? It's like even if it moves the same way, it'll get different sensor input. Even if it moves in the same way or almost identically in every case, because of the interaction with its environment that's clearly generating some difference, enough difference for it to know. Yeah? Magnifying intercategory differences doesn't necessarily mean that it needs to do completely different actions 
uh, in these different circumstances. Okay. okay. All right, that's the robot in action. Let's dive inside the robot's mind. And one of the nice things about phase diagrams where we can visualize what's going on in two dimensions. Oh, sorry, before, before that, uh, we've seen this before. They did three different evolutionary runs, starting with one random population of CTRNNs, evolved for 500 generations, go back, create a different population of random CTRNNs, evolve them again, evolve them again. We'll see this again over and over again in a lot of these experiments. Evolutionary algorithms are stochastic. There's some randomness built in. Sometimes the evolutionary process gets lucky and got a good set of initial random CTRNNs and was very, it was able to rapidly evolve active categorical perception. In this third run here, or the second run, it's a little bit unlucky, but it eventually got there. So they were able to consistently evolve ACP for this robot. Yeah. Okay, now the fun part. Like we saw uh, uh, last time, they took the best CTRNN, the one that had highest fitness, the robot that enabled the robot to do the best job at uh, active categorical perception, and they exposed it to unseen conditions. They put objects under the robot's palm in a way that the robot never experienced uh, during evolution. They did a total of 360 evaluations. They took the ellipsoid and exposed the robot to it by rotating the ellipsoid to a lot of different orientations under the robot's palm. And they did the same thing with the sphere. They exposed the robot to the sphere 180 times, and they rotated it. They rotated the sphere, but the robot can't detect the rotation, right? Because the sphere is uh, symmetric. What happened? What did the robot, what was the robot's mental experience here? in these 360 evaluations. Is that like, it wasn't as sure about the ellipsoids as it was about the sphere? I wasn't as sure about the ellipsoids as the spheres. What led you to that conclusion? The box around the sphere category is much smaller. The box around the sphere category is smaller. That may or may not mean that the robot is less sure about ellipsoids than spheres. Why do you think the box is bigger? Well, I was going to oh. answer the earlier question in that it looks like there's two ellipsoids that have been like, categorized. There's there also that. Yes, that's also true. Yeah, so maybe you're right. Maybe it is not less sure about one category than the other. Why is the ellipsoid box bigger? <clears throat> there may be like more conditions for like dimensions and other like ellipsoids can vary a lot based on spheres. Like spheres will always have the same. Yep, ellipsoids vary a lot. I mean, obviously, the geometry of the ellipsoid, when we place it at different orientations, there's more diversity there in the geometry. But it's not specifically that diversity that matters. It is the diversity. Is it more varied sensor input? As long as that geometric diversity is felt by the robot, it induces a broader range of perceptions from the robot's perspective, right? When you try and fumble for your phone, you can get different tactile experiences, but the range of those experiences is much narrower than cuddling with your cat or your dog, right? There's a greater range because you're dealing with a more complex object, right? The range of sensory repercussions becomes broader, right? Despite that, we have a category for cat, dog, cell phone. Certain categories, lead to a greater range of experiences, which makes categorization more difficult. Yeah. Uh, somebody mentioned two miscategorizations here, right? So two of, uh, uh, two of the R sub Ds, the ellipsoids, fell on or in the categories per, per sphere. So these were two out of the 360, tri, uh, 360 evaluations where the robot was presented with an ellipsoid and it thought it was a sphere. What's happening out here? 
can't tell. It's an ellipsoid, but it's not sure. It's an ellipsoid or it's a sphere. Other than that, most of the time, the robot knew what was what. Not bad. Huh? There's some other, maybe perhaps puzzling details in this visualization. What, what else is going on? There's like two main like blocks for um, the sphere. Yep, two main blocks for the sphere. Why? The two different initial positions in the camp. Yep, so I, I withheld that detail. So these 360 evaluations were done either starting from position A or position B, which explains the two groups here. But you would think that, you, that it, within one of these piles, so these were all the spheres placed when the robot was in one of those two initial positions, but those, all those boxes, they're not lying directly on top of one another. Why do you think they're not? This is one additional detail of the experiment I haven't mentioned. You might be able to infer it from this. These are spheres, they're placed at exactly the same position underneath the palm. The robot's always starting from the same initial position. Why are these boxes, why is 47 and 48 not doing exactly the same thing in these cases? In these cases? It's like the robot grab it just a little differently. It does grab it a little bit differently in these cases, but why? Any ideas? There's no randomness in the CTRNN itself. CTRNN is the same. The investigators put a little bit of noise in the simulation. Every time the robot moved, the movement was a, li a little bit different from what was expected. This is a typical thing in simulation when you're simulating robots, because when we go to build a robot and the robot says, rotate my arm to 120 uh, degrees, it's never going to get to exactly 120. It'll get to 121, 19. Nothing in the real world is perfect. So they wanted to, to sort of throw that in to, again, make the simulation a little bit more realistic. Yeah. It's a minor detail, but there you go. OK, so that's, this is the best CTRNN from one of those three runs. They did three evolutionary trials. Here's some more. Here's, here's the one we just looked at. Uh, here is uh, the best evolved controller from run number two, the second, uh, the second run. And we've got our two bounding boxes here. Here's the second best CTRNN from that run. And here's the third best CTRNN from that run. Gold, silver, and bronze. What's going on in these three or possibly these four CTRNNs? There's some common patterns across these successful solutions, and also some differences. Um, so like there's a small block for spheres and bigger for ellipsoids, and then the magnitude of where the boxes are is like very different. Like the angle on the right is supposed to be narrow position-wise, and the one on the left. Absolutely. So if you if you look at the actual ranges on these axes, they're very different, right? It doesn't actually matter what the absolute value of 47 and 48 is. It's just the relative values of these uh, neurons as they change over time is what matters, right? They need to be separated from one another. Yeah. In this particular controller here, the bounding box for sphere is incredibly small. Okay, so we now have a robot. We can evolve it to do active categorical perception through this admittedly complicated process. But as promised, by doing it this way, if we were to extend this experiment and now start to uh, expose the robot during evolution to spheres, ellipsoids, and rectangular solids, we could start to evolve it to distinguish between all three objects. How? What would you need to change about this experiment to evolve a robot to perform ACP between these three different types of objects? We could, we could, we could tack on neuron 40, 49, but we don't want to do that. We want to save neural real estate. We're going to pack categorization of three objects 
into 47 and 48. All the business functions to avoid overlapping anyway. Uh, uh, alter the fitness function, right? We could leave everything about the experiment the same, except that during simulation, we're going to throw cubes into the mix. But we're going to rewrite F2. We're going to try and minimize the overlap between C sub S and C sub D. And C sub S and C sub uh, R for rectangular solid. I know we're already using R's, but right? We've got three bounding boxes now. The one for spheres, the one for ellipsoids, and the one for C sub R, the category for rectangular solids. We want to minimize any potential overlap. Let's do it in our heads. We do it, the robot evolves three bounding boxes that are not overlapping, and now, in theory, we should be able to expose it to new instances of those three objects. Maybe we put some of those objects at slightly different positions under the robot's palm or at new orientations, and it should be able to recognize three objects. Let's keep going. Prisms. How do we change the experiment now? Four different objects. Just keep going, right? Another bounding box. How many, how many different objects do you think we could evolve the robot to actively categorize in this way? This many. Who knows, right? It seems, again, neuroscience keeps changing its mind about this, but it seems that you don't have dedicated neurons for the things that are important to you in your life. There's a, a not, this argument is often known as the grandmother cell argument. Whenever you see your maternal grandmother, think about your maternal grandmother, uh, eat the cornbread that your maternal grandmother sent you, that neuron, out of your 10 to the 11 neurons, that one always fires. That's the one that's been dedicated to your maternal grandmother. The, at the, the early days of neuroscience, as evidence was accumulating, there was some evidence that seemed to suggest maybe yes. Maybe no. My interpretation of the current literature is there is much more evidence saying whatever the answer is, it's not that simple. You don't have a neuron for CS206, maternal grandmother, your first pet, and so on and so forth. Whatever Mother Nature uh, came up with, she is encoding concepts in your mind in a distributed manner. OK, let's take this experiment one step further, and then we'll switch to locomotion. We've been thinking about uh, different categories just by, in a binary way. Either, they, they, either, this object, uh, either these two objects belong to the same category or different categories, nothing in between. Yeah? Imagine we evolved robots in the presence, or we evolved a robot in the presence of small ellipsoids and slightly bigger ellipsoids and spheres. How might you change the fitness function now to evolve a robot that can actively categorize between three different objects where two of them are more similar to one another than the third one? Most of us hopefully would agree that slightly smaller or slightly larger ellipsoids are closer to one another. They're more similar than spheres. We, a concentration in the, the sphere category where the different sizes would come around? We could. So we could take the category for ellipsoid and sort of break it into a subset. And anything that falls within here, this is the robot telling us it thinks it's in the presence of large ellipsoids. And anything that falls in here is in the presence of smaller ellipsoids. Could do that. We could assign just three different bounding boxes, again, for these three different categories, and then incorporate those three bounding boxes into the fitness function in what way? What should the fitness function evolve 47 and 48 to do to construct these three different categories? 
should probably have like a higher focus on making sure that the uh, two similar categories are as different as possible. Uh, as different as possible. Yeah. What does it mean for two rectangles to be as different as possible in two dimensions in this geometric interpretation? And be as like far away. Far away, right? So distance between categories, not just overlap now, but distance could be used as semantics or meaning, right? If you show human subjects a whole bunch of objects and say which one doesn't belong, or which of these subset of objects are more similar than the others, the human is starting to tell you something about semantic distance. How far, are, how far or close are various concepts semantically in an abstract sense? Here, we could get the robot to also start to do that, where at least in terms of the dynamics or the change of the neurons, distance is literal now. Distance between the way in which these two neurons behave. Yeah? Okay, we could keep going. This is a fun one. We could just keep going, but I think we'll stop here. Any other questions before we switch gears to locomotion? Okay. All right. So uh, we're going to talk about locomotion now in lecture, uh, lectures 11 and 12. And I'm going to start by asking you a question. Uh, this was first posed by Rodolfo Linas, a very famous neuroscientist. Why don't plants have brains? They don't need to move. I've kind of already given you the answer here, right? Lots of different ways to categorize life. One of the easiest ways for us, and there a clear distinction between a lot of what's out there, is the organisms that have chosen to stay put and survive that way versus the others which have decided to move as a strategy to stay alive, thrive, reproduce. Why do you need brains for movement? Or why don't plants need brains if they're not going anywhere? There's a lot of, a lot of the, like plants do are things that can be like automated without like needing like um, the kind of like specific like the benefits that like a neural network would provide. Like um, like a lot of it's just like reactions that are like kind of like like reacting to sunlight to like um, do whatever and like it just isn't as um, like precise. I don't know what the word for it is. Yeah, we're, we're getting there, right? There's some plants don't need dot, 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 right? So they don't need neural networks to do, they don't need nervous systems to do dot, dot, dot. They get food. But what is dot, dot, dot? Well, they get food. Plants get food. Animals get food. They get them in different ways. What is it exactly that animals need to do? Anything that moves around needs to do, that nervous system seem to be a good solution, a good way to get that thing. So they need to be able to respond to st stimuli? They need to respond to stimuli, so do plants. They have to respond to sunlight and orient towards them. So it's not, it, it, we're getting closer, but both groups need to respond, but both groups need to respond in different ways. Isn't that, um speed yeah as the sun arcs overhead plants can sort of take their time if you're on the move there are a million things that can occur where you need to react quickly such as luckily none of them are happening in this room right now knock on wood a fire yeah that's a, actually that's a follow-on from Linus's question right Plants can't run away from forest fires. It's a pretty big cost, That's, and they take that cost quite often. Yeah? Once you can move, you can avoid certain things that are fast moving in the world, like forest fires, by moving quickly. Yeah? OK, so speed is one issue. And nervous systems, one of the things that nervous systems have been evolved to do is speed, is to be able to communicate electrical impulses over long distances. In our cases, that can be over six feet in some cases. There's another, there's another uh, problem or challenge that arises the minute you as a species 
hit on movement as a strategy to survive and thrive in the world. That's not just necessarily about speed. Another problem to which, again, nervous systems seem to be a good solution. Is it spatial perception and reasoning? So spatial perception and reasoning is something that our brains do for us to support or deal with the challenge. What's the challenge? Why do I need to look around and reason about the world around me? Because you're constantly changing your environment. I'm constantly changing my environment. As you move, my new environment is different from my old environment. Let's keep going. What, what challenge does that provide? The new environment is dangerous. Could be. Could be dangerous. What else is happening? As I move from point A to point B, I'm obviously changing environments. I'm changing faster than a plant changes orientation to track the light. What else is happening? Other things are moving. Other things are moving, Other things are moving regardless of whether I move. I'm causing a problem for myself the moment I move, or causing a challenge that my nervous system is supporting and trying to solve all the time. Uh, we'll get to bipedal locomotion. Um, like, um, Homo homeostasis, that's a great point. All organisms need to deal with homeostasis, right? Not too hot, not too cold, not too hungry, not too full. Keeping your balance, so I'm, I'm saying we, when I say we, at the moment, I mean all terrestrial and aquatic animals. Anything that moves, not everything that moves, everything that moves in water does not need to stay upright. There's a general issue we all share. Anything that moves, moves itself. Remember in this course, we're trying to think not just about the organism or the machine or the environment. I'm moving into a dangerous environment. The interaction, we're trying to focus on the interaction. It's like knowing how to move its muscles to get to where it wants to go. I, I, yes, yes. So once I decide I want to move, it's not so obvious to know how I actuate all the muscles in my body to get from point A to point B. That, that's a good point. That is also a challenge. That's not the one I'm hammering on here. Put, put yourself in my shoes. Keep right directing. Sorry? Deciding where to move, yeah, decision making, that's, not, that's another challenge. Lots of challenges to movement, yeah? You guys are really good this morning about coming up with all the challenges except the one that I'm fishing for. <laughs> What's happening from my point of view as I move? You're all moving, right? Every time I move, everything moves from my perspective. I need some pretty good spatial reasoning to say, okay, actually, no, it wasn't all of you that moved, it was me. Piper moved less, the person in the back moved more, that's motion parallax. I know what's happening as I'm moving. If I, if I stay still and I stay stationary, there's only, and I'm acting, there's a small change in my perception when this is happening. The moment this set of action happens, everything starts changing and I need to deal with that and I probably need to deal with that pretty quickly. If I'm a prey species and I'm moving and there's a predator nearby, that's a good time to strike. A predator likes to move when prey is moving because it's hard to tell. Am I moving? Is the other thing moving? Are we both moving? It's tricky. Yeah? So Locomotion, the minute there was evolutionary pressure on very, very early animals to move about, suddenly there was a whole bunch of other problems that came up, speed, uh, change in perception, that the animal needed to solve in some way. That was the beginning of the evolution of nervous systems, having to deal with all of that. Brains began to evolve, not everybody agrees with this, but there is more, mostly consensus in the scientific community that the thing, the evolutionary pressures that pushed for the, evo the early evolution of nervous systems was self-motion. That's why animals have brains and plants do not. Nothing against plants. This is not to say that they are not intelligent. They are, and are not fantastically complex. There's a lot of things going on with plants. 
but they've got different sets of problems to solve than those that we do. Yeah. So you were mentioning visual perception. In solving, in solving locomotion problems, the evolution of brains started to solve other problems that lucky, lucky for hominids and a few other species, it turns out that we can also use that mental capacity to solve other problems other than the problems that are raised by locomotion, like math, Sudoku problems, composing poetry, all the other stuff that we think of as intelligence has its roots in locomotion, which is why many of us in robotics study legged locomotion or mobility. It's not just to make machines that move, it's to make machines that move and pave their own way to starting to solve other problems than locomotion. Make sense? So we're gonna start in lecture 11 with locomotion, and we've already looked at a lot of the, co the cognitive building blocks. Hopefully you'll start to see how some of these cognitive building blocks we've already looked at can sit on top of locomotion. Okay, off we go. I was hoping to bring one of my favorite books to class today, but someone in my lab has this book and I'm not sure who. If you're interested in what we just talked about, I highly, highly recommend Alexander's Principles of Animal Locomotion. The first few slides here are just the table of contents from this book. Alexander is a biomechanicist. He looks at the mechanics of locomotion, and in this book, he surveys all the different ways that animals have evolved to get from point A to point B. As you already know, there's a diversity of solutions. Why are there so many diversity of solutions for locomotion out there? One of the reasons why is that there is no optimal way to move. There is no best way. Any any strategy for moving from point A to point B on this planet requires the animal or the machine to strike a balance between at least four competing desiderata, displacement, robustness, energy, and stability. Yeah? Let's look at some of these antagonisms. As you displace yourself faster and faster in the world, you're late for class, so you switch from walking to running to sprinting. You gain speed, maybe you make it to class on time, but you have to give up something else. What are you giving up? Dignity, Dignity possibly, yes. Which is a follow on from some of, some of these, mostly this one. If you were to run to your next class today, what are you possibly giving up? Dry clothes, exactly, right? For us, at least as bipeds, the faster you go, the more difficult it is to maintain stability, and even more so in certain <coughs> environments. You're giving up not just stability as you increase your speed, what else are you giving up? Energy, energy right? Requires more energy to move faster. What are some of the other antagonisms between these four uh, desiderata? <coughs> Every animal species on the planet has struck different trade-offs between these. Absolutely. So a newt or any any uh, uh, any reptiles that stay very close to the ground, they're basically solving the stability problem, and they're also more robust. Also, by being smaller, they can move up walls, along ceilings something that we can't do, but they give up displacement. They also give up energy. It's very energy inefficient to move very close to the ground. Why? You have to move your legs like more times to go the further distance. You have to let, move your legs more times to go the same distance that uh, mammals, for example, have to go. Why? What's going on here? Yep. Why? What's, why is it energy inefficient to move with your legs horizontal rather than vertical? 
we have vertical legs. We actually are very energy efficient. Not that I recommend it, but you can eat half a Big Mac and walk, assuming you're in relatively good shape, walk miles and miles and miles. Not a lot of animals actually could, can do that, assuming you could get them to eat a half a Big Mac. We like to rely on gravity better. We talked about this before, and we'll talk about this in bipedal, uh, when we talk about bipedal locomotion. Our particular strategy is very energy efficient because half of the time, all the muscles in your legs are relaxed. They're swinging. If you bench press or you try and move along the ground doing this, you are at, your muscles are tensed all the time, keeping your legs partly or completely off the ground, right? It's very energy inefficient. So you give up energy efficiency, but you gain stability. You no, no longer need to worry about falling over. You gain in robustness. You don't really gain in displacement. Yeah, lots of, lots of trade-offs. Any others? There are plenty of trade-offs. Some of them are more subtle than others. Yep. What about slots? Where? What? What? What are they striking here? What balance they are they striking? Are more energy efficient, but they move very slowly. Absolutely. So brachiators, brachiators like sloths and gibbons, they can actually be quite energy efficient. A lot of their muscles are slack for most of the time, in the same way that ours are slack for moving over flat ground. Gibbons can actually move pretty fast. Sloths, not so much. What, what, are, what are brachiators, animals that can swing through a uh, forest from limb to limb, air, aerial movers, what are they giving up? They're pretty energy efficient, very energy efficient like us. They're also pretty darn fast. What are they giving up? Robustness. Robustness, right? If there isn't another tree branch to grab, too bad for you, right? There's a narrower set of environments in which this particular strategy works. Yeah? OK, so in this book, again, I highly recommend it. Alexander starts by talking about muscle itself. Everything you do, not just locomotion, grasping, speaking, swallowing, although you might not realize it, thinking also, it's all driven by muscle. That is the only kind of motor we have. He goes through the details of exactly what muscle is and then starts to talk about the relationship, the energetic requirements of muscle and locomotion. What does size have to do with it? If you're small or large, how does that force your hand in terms of striking a balance between these four desiderata? How to study locomotion? How do biomechanicists study the way that animals move? Then he starts to get into, in subsequent chapters, all the different strategies that Mother Nature has discovered to get animals from point A to point B. Peristalsis, um, a very, very simple strategy. You expand and contract different parts of your one-dimensional body that allows you to burrow through the earth. We also are capable of peristalsis, although we don't use it for locomotion. I don't see anyone snacking at the moment. Yeah, digestion. Digestion. When you swallow, peristalsis constricts consecutive muscle bands in your throat, pulling the food down. Yeah? Very, very early strategy discovered by Mother Nature and was then exacted for other purposes like swallowing. Exaptation is a concept we'll see again several times in this course. Mother Nature prefers not to reinvent the wheel every time. If she comes up with a good strategy and then there's selection pressure, there's a need to do something else, she will often repurpose existing structure and function. She will exploit previous adaptations for new purposes. We are capable of peristalsis. That's an exapted uh, trait from earlier animals that used it to move. Walking, running, and hopping, these are things that us bipeds are more familiar with. Uh, climbing and jumping, we're not so good at it. Crawling and burrowing, we're really not so good at it. 
at least uh, unaided. Gliding and soaring, moving through the air. We're not gonna talk about that so much uh, in this course. We actually already answered this question. Common strategy in early animals is drag your body along the ground and move your arms horizontally. If you do that, it's not very energy efficient. It's even less efficient if your body is actually touching the ground. You know, you're dragging your body on the ground, generating waste heat, slowing you down. It's a very good strategy if you want to stay stable, climb up walls, do other things. Not so good if you need to be energy efficient. Hovering, powered forward flight, moving over the surface of water, unaided, again, something that's out of bounds to us large creatures. Swimming with oars and hydrofoils, swimming by undulation, swimming by jet propulsion, the cephalopods, octopi, squid, they take in uh, water and squirt it back out again, that's jet propulsion. A huge range of ways to get from point A to B, and m most, not all of the animals, uh, described in these chapters have brains that allow them to do it. Yeah? Brains evolved to support locomotion. Okay, all right. Very quickly, we're going to we're going to spend a few slides talking about animals, uh, continuing to talk about animals, and then we'll switch back to what we've learned about the ways animals move, and how that informs. Uh, our creation of moving machines, mobile robots. If we want to study this relationship between, for example, energy and displacement, we need to know, as an animal's moving about, how much energy is it using to move a given unit distance. This is a fascinating sub-area of biomechanics itself. We can instrument the animal in various ways, put them on a treadmill, and measure how much oxygen they're burning, right? All of us have fires uh, burning inside us that literally consume oxygen. The more oxygen you consume, if you can measure that, that's a very good proxy for how many calories you're actually burning. Yeah? You can then start to do interesting things like collect data and plot the relationship between, for example, speed of movement and the amount of power or energy required to do so. For those that can read the caption here, what particular animal is being studied here? If you can't read the caption, you might be able to guess from these energy curves. Humans, this is us, right? It's relatively, it's comfortable to walk at slow speeds. It becomes exponentially uncomfortable to walk at higher and higher speeds. So maybe for dignity reasons, because it looks silly to walk at very fast speeds, or because it just feels more comfortable, if we need to move at higher speeds, we switch to running. Anybody know why? Why is it that walking feels increasingly uncomfortable? You start burning not you start burning exponentially more energy when you walk faster. You're taking like less advantage of gravity. Taking less advantage of gravity. When you run, you literally throw yourself into the air and at least for very short periods of time when you're in the air, everything can relax, right? Not for too long, but for a little while. Uh, there's other subtleties. You can uh, command human subjects to walk on a treadmill with uh, at about one footfall per second, one hertz, which is what most of us walk at. Or you can ask people to take uh, very short strides very quickly or very long strides slowly. When you do, you find for most human beings, the energy minimum the place they feel most comfortable, where you're uh, burning the least oxygen, is about one hertz. Yeah. Inside, uh, inside the human nervous system and most higher animals' nervous systems, uh, there are certain uh, regular oscillations in brain activity. They all have different frequencies. One of the most obvious frequencies of oscillations in the brain is at one hertz. 
Linas wrote a whole book about this, whether or not that's just a coincidence or not. Okay. In order to talk about uh, legged locomotion, we're going to introduce a little bit of terminology. Um, when horses move or humans move, there are certain points of time during the gait, the way of moving, that all feet, for some of the gaits, all of our feet come off the ground. During walking, at any given time, there is one or possibly two of your feet that's in contact with the ground. When you're running, there are short periods of flight phase. All feet are off the ground. Uh, we have two, two recognizable gates, walking and running. Horses have five, sometimes six, gates. Over 100 years ago, uh, there was a question about during, uh, during trotting, is there a flight phase? If you actually watch a horse that's trotting, it's very difficult to see whether or not there's a flight phase. Over 100 years ago, uh, Moy Bridge, a photographer, started taking pictures of horses to see whether he could figure out whether they had a flight phase or not. It was difficult to figure it out, so he came up with this brilliant idea to try and stitch photographs together and watch each photograph quickly, one after the other. He made a machine that did this. It's the very first movie. The very first movie ever made was to try and answer the question of whether trotting horses have a flight phase. The answer is yes. OK. Stance phase, one or more feet on the ground. We can also talk about the stance and flight phase of an individual leg. During walking, in a human being, for any given leg, half of the time that leg is in flight phase, off the ground, half the time it's in stance phase. Okay. I love this video. A great way of visualizing uh, the different kinds of gates that are possible for quadrupeds. For any given animal, like us, dogs, horses, they can move at these different speeds. What's the trade-off? Why don't we all just sprint all the time? Energy, Energy stability, same thing. Lots of trade-offs here. OK. We can also, we just mentioned stability. We can, there are two different kinds of stability in legged locomotion, static and dynamic stability. Static meaning no movement, dynamic meaning movement. In static stability, that means that at any given point in time, we can stop moving and you won't fall over. Walking, human walking is a statically stable gait. One of, the, one of the advantages of walking, aside from its energy efficiency, is if I need to, I can stop and do something else. Running is not, human running is not statically stable. When I'm in the flight phase, when I'm in the air, I cannot suddenly stop moving and do something else. I give up static stability when I choose to run. Yeah. Dynamic stability is this concept that as you're moving, it is stable. If I happen to step on a slight irregularity in the ground, that's going to alter my motion for a little bit but I very quickly return to my stable gait, my way of moving. Yeah? The world might literally or metaphorically push against me as I'm moving. If I'm statically stable, I can recover again. How do we know whether, whether an animal or a machine is statically stable or not? At any given point in time, we can compute the polygon of support. At that point in time, we can draw on the ground points where all the feet are. We can then compute the animal or the machine's center of mass and take the horizontal component of that center of mass. We can take that center of mass and move it down to the ground. And if that center of mass is inside the polygon of support, as long as that polygon of support does not change, and the animal or machine's pose doesn't change, meaning the center of mass stays the same, it's statically stable. Yeah? The reason that walking is statically stable is that when both feet are in the stance phase, I have 
a polygon of support that looks like this. Here's my left foot and my right foot. And my center of mass is somewhere around here, I'm statically stable. The minute I'm on one foot, you, you probably have all had this experience, you're shifting your center of mass over your foot. It's not as easy, but I can stop at this point as well, stop at any point during walking. There's a reason for that, why that evolved to be in that case, right? Walking is good, it's good for stopping and starting, uh, and so on. Okay. If your center of mass is outside your polygon of support, you're statically unstable. Here's one last example. One last example we'll look at uh, some animal uh, data here. Uh, this is from uh, Alexander's book. They took a bunch of uh, ponies and allowed them to run around uh, in their pen. And at various points in time, the ponies were walking, trotting, or galloping. They were free to do any of these three gates. And they watched the particular speed that the ponies were moving during those three gates. They then trained those ponies to walk on very large treadmills. And they gradually turned up or turn down the speed of the treadmill. And you could watch the ponies switching from walking to trotting to galloping as they sped up the treadmill. While they were conducting this experiment with a the mask, they were also measuring the amount of CO2, uh, O2 uptake by the ponies. What happened? What did they find? When they compared energy and displacement in an artificial setting on the treadmill versus energy, uh, energy, uh, not, sorry, not just energy, they looked at just speed in an uncontrolled environment in the pen. They found a relationship between these two sets of data. What's the relationship? Not surprisingly, right? It's not just us. Most animals like to move at their, at their energy minimum. There are certain gates that correspond to different speeds. Okay, no discussion of animals would be complete without talking about this animal, which is usually an exception to every rule. Anything we know about animals, this animal always comes along and thumbs its nose at us. I don't know what gate this is. I don't know how energy efficient this is. There you go. Good old octopi. Okay, we've got two minutes left, so let's start in on locomotion in animals. This is quite a while now, uh, ago now, but I remember the day that this video was posted. It sent shockwaves through the robotics community and the general public as well. This was Big Dog, uh, Boston Dynamics' first real success. Tell me about the trade-offs that this machine is making between displacement, energy, robustness, and stability. Displacement, displacement it's moving. Can't move, super fast. Can't move super fast. Yeah, it's going relatively slowly. It's dynamically stable. That's probably the most dramatic example of dynamic stability. I don't think I can turn on the audio, but if I did, you'd hear this high-pitched whine coming from Big Dog, which is another hint about the trade-off that's been struck in this case. What's the high-pitched whine? Does anyone know? It's the motors for sure. It's always moving. It's always moving. Why are the motors ca causing a high pitch whine? You think this is running on a battery? There's a, there's a diesel engine in Big Dog here. This is not very energy efficient, but pretty robust. It can deal with a wide range of environments, much wider than any robot had been capable of before. When it slipped on the ice, Previously in the video, in these packs, it's carrying 325 pounds. Don't try this at home. 
carry a 325 backpack and go out on the skating rink uh, out, out there at his campus today. Not something that we are capable of. Okay, I think a good place to pause. Oh, question? Do you know why they put that much weight on it? Uh, because they're trying to sell Big Dog to the Department of Defense. <laughs> if you're a soldier, what would you love a robot to do? Yeah. Carry your pack. You have a quiz due tonight. Undergrads, you're working on six. Uh, grads, you're working on final project ideas. See you on Tuesday.